I, Philip Carney, an old soldier, enter my solemn protest against this order for retreat. We ought, instead of retreating, should follow up the enemy and take Richmond. And in full view of all responsible for such declaration, I say to you all, such an order can only be prompted by cowardice or treason. Welcome, welcome, everybody. I'm Joe Cook, and you're listening to Wigs for Wigs. This week, a special new segment on Wigs for Wigs. I'm bringing you the first in a series of mini-sodes that I'm going to do about forgotten, underrated, and what-if figures from American history. And we're going to start with one of the latter of those categories, Somebody whose story was cut too short to see what they may have done in American history, but seemed destined for greatness. And that is New Jersey hero of the Civil War, General Philip Kearney. General Philip Kearney came from a wealthy Irish-American family that owned homes in New York and in New Jersey. His uncle was General Stephen Kearney, who captured much of the Southwest and participated in capturing California for the United States during the Mexican War. Interestingly, Stephen Kearney, the uncle, tended to spell his last name with an E before the Y at the end of it. That is K-E-A-R-N-E-Y. But Philip Kearney, the Civil War hero, the nephew, Spelled it K-E-A-R-N-Y. And I know it's a name it's easy to look at and mispronounce. People say Kearney, but it is pronounced Carney. That comes from the Irish, uh, that E-A-R making an R sound. Philip Carney seemed destined for a military career. Like I said, his uncle was a prominent soldier. His father served in the military. And from a young age, Philip showed great interest in military heroics and a military life. He was sent to France to attend their prestigious cavalry school. Then he even served in combat with the Chasseurs d'Afrique, the elite French cavalry unit that was serving in North Africa at the time. These French soldiers impressed with his bravery, gave him his nickname, Carney Le Magnifique, or the American, Carney the Magnificent. Returning from France after a, a period of service, he served as an officer in the Dragoons in the Mexican War, the, the great American cavalry units of the Mexican War, whose officer ranks were filled with men who would go on to be prominent in the Civil War. Philip Kearney served as the commander of a squadron that eventually was selected by General Winfield Scott, the commander of the American army in the Mexican War. Old Fuss and Feathers, the grand old man of the Union, Winfield Scott, chose Kearney's squadron to serve as his personal bodyguard, quite a station of honor for this cavalry officer who already had extensive extensive combat experience, having served with the French. In this Mexican war, Kearney was in the midst of the action occasionally, despite his unit's designation as General Scott's bodyguard. At the Battle of Churubusco, on the way to Mexico City, General Captain Kearney led a charge into a Mexican battery of artillery. His arm was shattered and torn apart by a shot of grape shot, which is when a cannon is essentially turned into a giant shotgun. The arm had to be removed, leaving Kearney for the rest of his life as what the Confederate Army of the, Conf- of the Civil War would later call him that one-armed devil or that one-armed Yankee devil. So a hero of the Mexican War, 
losing an arm at Churubusco. General Scott, very impressed with Philip Carney, called him, quote, a perfect soldier, end quote. And at another time, quote, the bravest man I ever knew. Now, Winfield Scott had been in the U.S. Army, served in the U.S. Army as a general, not even just in the Army, from the time of the, Me of the War of 1812 all the way to the early stages of the Civil War. It's nearly 50 years on active service as a general in the U.S. Army. He knows lots of people. <laughs> and yet he says that Philip Kearney was the bravest man he ever knew. I think we have to take General Scott at his word there. Um, he didn't dole out praise um, undeservedly. It, it's very rare that individuals got really heaping praise from Winfield Scott personally for their actions. Robert E. Lee famously, Winfield Scott called the finest soldier in the U.S. Army at one point. Lee was directly at Scott's side during the Mexican War. Joseph Johnston, who went on to Civil War prominence, Scott once said in a commendation, was a very fine soldier but had a bad habit of getting shot in nearly every engagement. And here Philip Carney gets this over-the-top praise from Winfield Scott, calling him a perfect soldier and the bravest man I ever knew. After the Mexican War, Scott resigned from the U.S. Army in the 1850s. It was a bit of scandal, not Scott, Philip Carney resigned from the Army in the 1850s. There was a bit of scandal surrounding him involving his new marriage. I'm not going to go into that right now because it's not directly relevant to our story, but you can look into it if you wish. It was a big scandal in that small army community of the 1850s who Philip Carney chose to marry, the circumstances of that. But he resigns from the army once again, and he goes back to traveling around the world. He was very wealthy, as I mentioned. He comes from a very wealthy family, and he decided to use his wealth to travel. He goes really all around the world before finding his way back to France. And at this time, Napoleon III is in power in France. And it's in the midst of the early stages of the wars of Italian unification, a series of wars that happened in the 1840s, 1850s, 1860s, into the 1870s even, to unify Italy into one country. Um, this was kind of trying to pry Italy, the Italian city-states of Italy, out of the control and the competition of Italy, of, not Italy, of Sardinia, the two Sicilies, Austria, the superpower to its northeast, and France, the superpower to its northwest. And Napoleon III plays a role in these wars, and Carney joins Napoleon III's army. He once again joins the Chasseur d'Afrique Regiment, that elite cavalry unit of the French army, and eventually he changes to being a member of Napoleon III's Imperial Guard Cavalry, the, the truly highest elite of the French cavalry units. And in that role, in that unit, he served in one of the great battles of the War of Italian Unification, the Battle of Solferino. For his actions in that battle, I mean, remember, this is a guy who already lost an arm a few years earlier, and now he's seeking out where he can continue to serve in battle. And in the, for his actions at the Battle of Solferino, Philip Carney becomes the first American ever to be awarded the French Legion of Honor. Now, hundreds of Americans will eventually receive this award, especially for World War II service. The French were very generous and grateful to American service to liberate them in World War II, and a lot of Americans are going to receive the Legion of Honor. But Philip Carney is the very first for his service at Solferino in Napoleon III's Imperial Guard Cavalry. He stays in France for several years, but when the Civil War breaks out in America, he comes home to offer his services to the Union. 
He was very much against slavery. That part is not often told in Philip Carney's uh, life story. He's usually just portrayed as a soldier without, without much political motivation. But he is very committed to the anti-slavery cause in his own way. Donated money to anti-slavery organizations. And between that, unionism, American patriotism, and just his hunger for a fight, wherever it may be, Carney returns to America and offers his services to the Union. Now, again, just keep in mind, this is a guy who's fabulously wealthy. He didn't have to do any of this, really, in his life. He could have sat back and lived a life of luxury, continued just traveling around the world and enjoying himself. But instead, there's a battle, and Philip Carney needs to be in the middle of it. He ultimately takes command of the New Jersey Brigade, made up of the 1st, 2nd, 3rd, and 4th New Jersey regiments, and eventually other regiments be swapped in and out of the New Jersey Brigade. He serves in the Union Army of the Potomac through the Peninsula Campaign of George McClellan, where McClellan tries to capture Richmond by sailing south of Richmond and coming up from the Peninsula of Virginia, It's during that time he begins to butt heads with the Union General-in-Chief. George McClellan had many flaws. If you're a Civil War buff, as I am, Civil War enthusiast, or even just a military history enthusiast, you may be aware of some of those flaws. But he was a very, very cautious general, is one of his biggest flaws. He could be argumentative, he could be petty, he was haughty. He was arrogant. He thought he knew better than everybody else. He had lots of flaws that the list could go on and on. But he really was a very cautious general. And that is not Philip Carney, the old dragoon. As McClellan crawled up the Virginia, the Virginia Peninsula, being fooled by logs being painted black and thinking that they were cannons and halting his army to bring up a siege at Yorktown. By be, from being fooled by campfires being lit by the Confederates with no soldiers around them to make it look like there were more Confederates than there really were. Or the same units marching around in circles to make it look like there were more Confederates than there really were. McClellan fell for all of these things. And Philip Carney began to have enough with his commanding general. He began referring to him as the Virginia Creeper. Didn't very rarely called him General McClellan from that point on, after the siege of Yorktown, the, the Civil War siege of Yorktown by McClellan, not the more famous and important siege of Yorktown from the Revolution. McClellan crawled up the peninsula, finally was drawn into battle by Confederate General Joseph Johnston at Fair Oaks or Seven Pines on May 31st, 1862. It's a very messy battle. The Confederates had opportunities to really strike a blow against McClellan. Those fail for various reasons. But one of those reasons is that Philip Kearney organizes a gallant countercharge at a key moment of the battle with his brigade commanders, Hiram Berry, um, Jameson, and David Burney. Although Burney may have been on, on leave at that moment. I have to, don't, I'm not 100% not sure about that. But David Burney was one of his brigade commanders who goes on to greater fame later in the Civil War. Kearney organizes this very important counterattack. He's right in the middle of the battle. I mean, he, quite, he cuts quite a heroic figure. Look up a, a picture of, of Philip Kearney. He, he's very physically imposing. He has a, a, a thin, um, intimidating, sharp face, a, a well-defined goatee, um, he, he has a very sharp uh, but muscular body, despite the fact that he's missing his arm. He cuts quite an imposing figure on the battlefield. He looks like a cavalryman and a daunting, intimidating figure. That one-armed devil is a good nickname for him that the Confederates referred to him. He organizes his countercharge, and it halts Confederate momentum at a key moment of the battle. It is in that battle, though that Joseph Johnson, the Confederate commander, is badly wounded. 
And that's a really critical moment in the entire Civil War. Because when Joseph Johnston is wounded, and again, if you know history, you know this, but Robert E. Lee takes his place. This is how Robert E. Lee comes into command of the Confederate Army of Northern Virginia, as he renames it. That's a great what if. What if Joe Johnston was never wounded at Fair Oaks or Seven Pines and remained in command of his army and Robert E. Lee never took over command of the Confederate Army in Virginia? Who knows? American history would be much different in that story. But that did play out. Johnston goes down. Lee takes over. And over the next few weeks, Lee is going to drive General McClellan's army away from Richmond in a series of fights called the Seven Days Battle. It is a series of battles over seven days. There are six days, six battles in seven days. Malvern Hill, Glendale, Mechanicsburg, and others. The last of these battles, well, these battles completely unnerve George McClellan, the Union commander. He was never all that eager to fight to begin with. And now he is, he's had enough of fighting. And he's ready to withdraw. The last of the Seven Days Battles was a battle called Malvern Hill. And at this battle, Robert E. Lee had very, very wastefully hurled his men at the Union, who were in very strong positions on top of high ground. Lee launched frontal assaults against these Union positions and they were all completely, completely futile. It's a resounding tactical victory for the Union. And yet, at the end of the day, George McClellan orders his army to withdraw from this very powerful defensive position they have. And it's that withdrawal that prompted Phil Carney to say the quote I had at the top of this episode where he says to the other officers around him, such an order, the order to retreat, can only be prompted by cowardice or by treason. Now that's quite a thing to level at the commander of your army, the general-in-chief of the entire Union Army at this time in history, George McClellan. Many men might have thought that. Phil Carney said it out loud. Um... It's interesting that General McClellan, who almost certainly heard about these comments, never really challenged Philip Kearney on them. Maybe it's because he didn't get a chance, though. In the following weeks, Robert E. Lee moved his army north on his way to ultimately invading the north. But along the way, he fought the massive battle at Second Bull Run, or Second Manassas, the last couple days of August. It's a resounding Confederate victory. He drives a Union army led by John Pope from the field. And in the aftermath of this battle, Philip Kearney, whose division had made its way back north on transport ships since the withdrawal from the Seven Days Battles, Philip Kearney took command of the rear guard, covering the retreat of this army from the Second Battle of Bull Run. And as the leader of the rear guard, he fights a small battle against the Confederates who are pursuing the Union Army called the Battle of Chantilly at the start of September 1862. The Battle of Chantilly was fought in a driving rainstorm, horrible rainstorm. General Kearney, reconnoitering, wanting to be aggressive, wanting to fight, fight it out with the Confederates, got too far out in front of his men, separated from his units, and suddenly, in the darkness, in the rain, found himself surrounded by enemy soldiers from Stonewall Jackson's Corps. They demanded that this Union rider who rode into the midst of them surrender. Kearney refused. Surrender wasn't his thing. Such a thing would only be prompted by cowardice. So with his sword in one hand, the only hand he had left, and the reins in his teeth, 
which was the style of riding he had learned while he was in France. He spurred his horse and he tried to escape. The Confederates watched amazed for a moment, but then a volley rang out. General Kearney, who was riding low in the saddle, trying to take cover as best he could while riding away, was struck in the lower back, the bullet passed through his body, and he fell from his horse, dead. General Ambrose Powell Hill, the Confederate general who commanded that division that fired on General Kearney, personally identified Kearney's body. Again, the officer corps of the old army was a small fraternity. These men knew each other. Kearney was a very noteworthy person, having led General Scott's bodyguard in the Mexican War. And General Hill, the Confederate commander, when he identified Phil Kearney's body, said to the soldiers around him, you've killed Phil Kearney. And he was shaking his head. You've killed Phil Kearney. He deserved a better fate than to die here in the mud. Word got up the chain of command in the Confederate Army that General Kearney had been killed, that one-armed Yankee devil. And Robert E. Lee, who was very well acquainted with Phil Kearney, again, they were both kind of in Winfield Scott's personal orbit during the Mexican War. Robert E. Lee retrieved General Kearney's body, ordered that his belongings that had been stripped from his body by some Confederate soldiers be returned and collected with his body. And they were sent north for burial under a flag of truce with a personal note of condolence from General Lee, a great soldier recognizing a great soldier, the finest soldier in America in Winfield Scott's estimation, recognizing and acknowledging the death of the bravest soldier in America in Winfield Scott's estimation. The body was brought more north where he was first buried with full military honors, of course, at Trinity Churchyard, right by the World Trade Center today, famous little cemetery. That is also where Alexander Hamilton is buried. Um, that cemetery has become really popular these last few years since the musical came out about Hamilton because Hamilton is buried there. His wife, Eliza Schuyler Hamilton, is buried there. And um, Hercules Mulligan, the spy, the tailor who became a spy, who's a character in the Hamilton play, is buried there. So it's become a very popular cemetery since the Hamilton musical came out. It's right by the World Trade Center. That is initially where Carney was buried. And then in the following years, the tributes came pouring in, especially from the people of New Jersey, this original commander of the New Jersey Brigade. A town was named for him a couple years after the war. They carved part of, I, think, I believe it was Harrison, was carved out. And a new town of Kearney, New Jersey, was created right here in Hudson County, where I teach, right next door to Jersey City. I passed through Kearney on many days, going home. So there's a town named for General Kearney. Statues are erected to General Kearney in several places around New Jersey. In Newark, where he had, had, he had owned a home. In Kearney, there's a statue. Over the years, Kearney will become one of the great symbols of New Jersey heroism in history. One of the two statues representing New Jersey in the Statuary Hall in Ca the U.S. Capitol in Washington, D.C. is of Philip Kearney, the other is of Richard Stockton, a signer of the Declaration of Independence. Although in 1912, the decision was made that Trinity Churchyard wasn't good enough for Kearney the Magnificent. His body was exhumed from its grave in Trinity Churchyard and in a very publicized and, and very um, 
patriotically enthusiastic ceremony. It was transported down to Washington, D.C., down into Northern Virginia, where he would be reinterred in Arlington National Cemetery. Of course, if you know Arlington National Cemetery's history, you know that was Robert E. Lee's home and plantation before the Civil War. So Robert E. Lee, who had sent the body north to have it buried where Carney came from, now, ironically, Carney rests on Robert E. Lee's property in Northern Virginia at Arlington. There are two equestrian statues in Arlington National Cemetery today. Equestrian statues, of course, statues on horseback of great soldiers. One of them is of Philip Carney. The other is of a British general from World War II. Um, interesting story behind why that's there. But General Carney is one of the two equestrian statues that stands in Arlington National Cemetery. A great honor for this great hero from New Jersey. I want to say one more word about the statue at Statuary Hall. Right, I said he is one of the two New Jerseyans represented at Statuary Hall in the U.S. Capitol building. However, in the last couple of years, the New Jersey state government approved a plan to replace General Carney with a statue of women's suffrage hero, Alice Paul. Now, I, ha I certainly have nothing against Alice Paul. She is a critical person in the history of the women's suffrage movement, really did a lot to get it across the finish line, the 19th Amendment. What I'm about to say has nothing to do with dishonoring, dishonoring Alice Paul. But I don't understand why Philip Carney's statue should be removed to replace, be replaced with anybody else. Carney has done nothing wrong in his story. This is a man who had no reason to put aside his life of luxury to fight for the United States time and again and elsewhere. Served with nothing but honor and distinction in the Civil War. Believed in anti-slavery causes. And died for the Union and in the war, for the war to ultimately abolish slavery. What else could you possibly want on a resume of an American soldier to keep him being honored in America's capital? Again, nothing at all against Alice Paul. I know every state only gets two statues, but I personally think if we're going to remove one to honor Alice Paul, remove Richard Stockton. Philip Carney deserves his statue in the U.S. Capitol building, if you ask me. Um, and I'm not saying Richard Stockton doesn't, but I think of the two, let's keep Philip Carney. Richard Stockton has a college named after him in New, here in New Jersey. I believe there's a town named after Richard Stockton. I'm not 100% sure about that. I know there's a rest area uh, named after Richard Stockton um, on one of the highways here in New Jersey. He's a signer of the Declaration of Independence, an important early politician in New Jersey history. Um, the father of a prominent, the patriarch of a prominent political family in New Jersey. In fact, one of his descendants helped capture California from Mexico. Commodore Rich, um, Robert Stockton in the Mexican War, alongside Phil Carney's uncle, Stephen Carney. There's a lot of connections here. But there is no reason in my belief that Philip Carney should have his statue removed. There's been some pressure on from historical groups and from the town of Kearney about this on the New Jersey state government. There have been statements put out by government officials saying this is not about dishonoring Phil Carney. But it is dishonoring Phil Carney. You're choosing to remove his statue. What did this guy do wrong? He died for America in our most important war. So, I'm sorry, up to me, I think Phil Carney deserves to stay in the U.S. Capitol building. And I, I encourage people, if you agree with me, you know, look into Phil Carney. Look into Richard Stockton's stories. But if you agree with me, reach out to representatives, reach out to the state government here in New Jersey, and let them know your thoughts that Phil Carney deserves to stay in the U.S. Capitol building. Alice Paul's statue can replace Richard Stockton 
or Alice Paul's statue could go in the New Jersey State Capitol building. You know whose statue could be removed from the New Jersey State Capitol building to make room for Alice Paul? Or make room for Philip Carney? There's a statue in the New Jersey Capitol building of George McClellan, the Virginia creeper, the man motivated by nothing but cowardice or treason. Let's take his statue out of the New Jersey State Capitol building and put one of these statues there in its place. That's my humble opinion. Carney was so important to the people of New Jersey that when New Jersey gained a state monument at the Gettysburg battlefield, even though General Carney never served at Gettysburg, he had died months before the Battle of Gettysburg in September of 1862. Gettysburg is July of 1863. Despite that fact, when New Jersey put up its state monument at Gettysburg, on one side of it, they included a bas relief of Philip Carney's face and marked it with some of his great battles from his lifetime, not just from America. Solferino shows up on there. Mexico, so for the Battle of Churubusco, where he lost his arm. And of course, Chantilly, where he was killed. But this was the great man of New Jersey in the Civil War, and he does not deserve to be removed from his place of honor. I want to end today with a poem that was written about General Kearney after his death. This was written by Edmund Clarence Stedman. It's called Kearney at Seven Pines, but it doesn't just talk about Seven Pines. It's going to refer to Chantilly when he is killed. So that soldierly legend is still on its journey, that story of Kearney who knew not to yield. T'was the day when with, when with Jameson and Berry and Bernie against 20,000 he rallied the field. Where the red volleys poured, where the clamor rose highest, where the dead lay in clumps through the dwarf oak and pine, where the aim from the thicket was surest and nighest, no charge was like Phil Carney's along the whole line. When the battle went ill and the bravest were solemn, near the dark seven pines where we still held our ground, he rode down the length of the withering column and his heart at our war cry leapt up with a bound. He snuffed like his charger the wind of our powder. His sword waved us on and we answered the sign. Loud our cheer as we rushed, but his laugh rang the louder. There's the devil's own fun, boys, along the whole line. How he rode his brown steed, how we saw his blade brighten, in the once hand still left, and the reins in his teeth. He laughed like a boy when the holidays heightened, but a soldier's glance shot from his visor beneath. Up came the reserves to the melee infernal, asking where to go in, through the clearing or the pine. Oh, anywhere, forward, tis all the same, Colonel. You'll find lovely fighting along the whole line. Oh, evil that black shroud of night at Chantilly, that hid him from sight of his brave men and tried. Foul, foul sped the bullet that clipped the white lily, the flower of our knighthood, the whole army's pride. Yet we dream that he still, in that shadowy region, where the dead form their ranks at the wan drummer's sign, rides on, as of old, down the length of his legion, and the word is still forward along the whole line. Thank you for tuning in to this special episode of Wigs for Wigs. Take care, everybody.